Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll talk about a, a tsunami or a, a earthquake or something that happened within the medical device industry. And we'll talk that, about that with Eric Volbrecht. So Eric, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hi, everyone. So uh, Eric, um, I mean, uh, December is a month of normally some kind of gifts with some Christmas present, etc. So Oh, we definitely. had some announcements, but um, I will ask you maybe, is it a Christmas present or not? But we had a situation that was happening on December 9th uh, at the EPSCO meeting uh, in uh, in Brussels. So mm. can we just put a bit of the chronology in place of these oh, sure. things and yeah. then we try to, to comment it? Yeah, basically, I would say where it all started was the uh, MDCG 2020-11 position paper this summer. Yeah. In which the MDCG started hinting at, uh, hey, we might come up with a solution for people that have cert expiring certificates that uh, <clears throat> while the uh, notified body is not ready with the uh, conformity assessment procedure, and they already had some outlines in that position paper, right? Saying, yeah, you should uh, should have your, uh, uh, you should uh, be in manufacturing good standing. You should have an application in the works at least a year before certificate expiry, blah, 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 a number of criteria. And, uh, but they didn't really say that this was going to be Article 97 based because I think at that time, the member states were yeah they clearly knew that something needed to happen but on the other hand they didn't really know how to do it yeah and there were lots of companies uh clamoring for an extension whatever that means because everybody always says i want an extension and they don't know what it means yeah and uh <clears throat> and of course there was uh yeah, there was also, uh, there were uh, France and Germany, right, that had yep. uh, been mobilized politically to also say, uh, Commission, you have to do something about this. We need some kind of relief for uh, the total uh, mess that the MDR transitional regime is becoming. So do something. Then in September, we had the famous uh, MDCG uh, 19 points <clears throat> 2022-14 position paper <clears throat> of which I personally thought like, well, this is a nice wish list with uh, some definite maybes and some things that, that they would like other people to do. Exactly. <laughs> and some things thing. that they were actually telling themselves to do like, uh, hey, wouldn't it be nice if the pharmaceutical agencies also uh, uh, just put a bit of effort into uh, into the redoing of these marketing authorizations. Yes, of course, you idiots, because that is yourself. You are the member states in the MDCG. Medicines agencies are part of the same state. Come on, get a move on. So there were also some, uh, I think, some good um, proposals in there. And what you saw is that that position paper was really aimed at, uh, let's say, uh, lightening administrative burdens for yep. notified bodies, basically uh, allowing notified bodies to function more efficiently. Now, what we've seen then is uh, <clears throat> since this paper came out in uh, uh, in, uh, in September, two things were happening, I think, that were very clear. First of all, there were the notified bodies that suddenly, uh, or suddenly, that stepped to the plate and said, okay, now we get a lot of extra discretional powers, basically, uh, in this position paper. So we are going to fill up that space. So you saw a whole bunch of um, um, guidance documents come out of Team NB, yep. where they were really uh, yeah, trying to make sense of what this paper would allow them. So this is, uh, this is interesting. We've also seen some MDCG documents being... Uh, being done, notably the amendment to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, MDCG pay, uh, uh, guidance on uh, notified bodies, mm -hmm. which has this totally harebrained, stupid rule in it that um, uh, all the important personnel uh, in a notified body must must be employed 
by the conformity assessment body legal entity itself, yeah. which basically made it impossible to run an international notified body with any expertise in a different place than in the conformity assessment body itself. And I know that uh, I worked for several notified bodies as well, that especially the big ones were really, they had extreme difficulties with that uh, with that requirement. Basically, it was like, yeah, how can we make management of notified bodies extra difficult? Yes, yes, yeah, that, let's put in that measure. It's like somebody would have actually sat down and come up with it. I mean, it was so, yeah, uh, inconvenient, basically. Anyway, so... There were notified bodies were taking up space, uh, MDSG was uh, doing uh, things. And what you also saw, and that's nice, that you can basically read the whole story in the uh, uh, in the commission notes that it prepared for the famous 9 December EBSCO meeting. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, they prepared a note of uh, about uh, seven pages, which yeah. I've also uh, linked to on my blog, and you'll no doubt put it in the show notes as well. Yeah. In which you can basically read the whole um, the whole uh, story. What I found particularly interesting myself is that the uh, commission apparently thinks that they are really helping out people a lot by putting a lot of measures in the EU for health program. Yeah, which. I thought it was like, why? Because uh, they, in the MDCG position paper, they say, yeah, we need to help small and medium-sized enterprises. And then what they do is, okay, yeah, then we put some measures, some goals for proposals in this EU for health program, which makes no sense because basically you are reactively waiting for people to come with a plan so you can give them money so they can spend money on solving the SME problem. Yeah, true. Which is, of course, not a good way to deal with this. I mean, what the MDCG should do is say, we, the member states, tell notified bodies, we order notified bodies that they have to spend a specific amount of their time on SMEs, for example. But this is like, yeah, I mean, I was actually... Uh, well, as we would say in Dutch, uh, my pants uh, dropped or uh, now breaks my wooden shoe or something <laughs> or something uh, Dutch like that. But I mean, I was really amazed because, of course, this is the most inefficient and ineffective way to solve this problem, if you ask me. So I was like, yeah, congratulations, uh, Commission, but I am completely not convinced. Anyway, so then there's the... Uh, and then... This, this, uh, then we basically we get to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, EBSCO meeting. Just just before the EBSCO meeting, uh, just one additional thing, maybe uh, the Swiss. What's oh, about yes. the Swiss? Yeah, the Swiss, of course. Well, the Swiss are uh, the Swiss are being uh, being uh, quite a drama queens, uh, I would say, uh, because of course the Swiss thought like, oh, let's shake up this whole discussion a bit. We are going to do an Australia because if you remember the TGA in Australia already said at some point, uh, hey guys, we don't, we are not really uh, comfortable with where the CE marking system is going. So we are going to actively explore um, allowing FDA cleared devices on our market as a parallel uh, plan B basically. Exactly. And they did that already in 2020, 2021, quite some time ago. And, and I think nobody really paid attention to it until the Swiss, of course, uh, said, uh, hey, uh, we completely fucked up the uh, the institutional framework agreement that we first negotiate an agreement in Brussels. And then we're like, ah, no, but we cannot have the population vote on it because they will just say no. I mean... Yeah, it's it's about as unreliable as the Brits were in the Brexit negotiations. So where they did the exact same thing. First, you negotiate an agreement, okay. and then you go home, and then the Parliament says no. I mean, if I, as a lawyer, go into settlement negotiations like that without totally without a mandate, I negotiate an agreement for a client, and then I say, oh yeah, by the way, I have to go ask my client, but they will just say no. I mean. 
I would get disciplinary sanctions for that. That's, and everybody somehow thinks that this is an okay way to act as a country. But anyway, what the Swiss decided now, of course, is that they are running out of options because they basically base their whole uh, legal order for medical devices on the CE mark. And because of the MRA expiring, they have zero influence over what's happening. So they're basically completely at the mercy of whatever craziness happens in Europe in the transitional regime. True. But then some people thought like, okay, well, let's let's be really out of the box. We are going to come up with, uh, we're going to go Australian, right? Yeah. Of, of shrimp on the Barbie. And we are going to allow FDA cleared uh, devices on our market. Nobody ever really give it, gave it any kind of thought, I think, how the Swiss authorities are going to work with these, this dual system, for example, right? And how you could say that, for example, um, a CE mark device is non-compliant or an FDA cleared device is non-compliant. Basically, it means that, that the Swiss authorities would need to be completely retrained again in parallel on the American system. Because otherwise, yeah, you can't know if a device is compliant, right? I mean, yeah, sure. you know, somebody might be doing, uh, might be having the most terrible incidents in the US that, that you completely cannot uh, understand in Switzerland. So, I mean, it looks like a nice romantic idea and uh, it's, it's, but basically it's as stupid as the take back control a slogan for Brexit. I mean, it just, yeah, I, it looks nice, but I think in the practical application, uh, they are going to run into so much difficulties. We also, see. because they just don't have the resources to train the whole, uh, all the authorities and also train the whole market, by the way, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in American law. Yeah. And uh, then there is also the problem that, uh, of course, if you're going to say, well, we are going to give FDA cleared uh, devices, uh, we're going to let them on the market easily, it might give American manufacturers a huge advantage over European manufacturers. So I think there are a lot of practical problems that uh, the Swiss have not quite figured out yet. They'll discover that, I think, <laughs> soon. Yeah, yeah, they'll they'll find it out the hard way, just as everybody is exactly. all the time finding out the hard way. That's actually pretty difficult to make good legislation for, uh, for these for medical devices. Hey, just a second. Do you need an EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. So, uh, so, so in terms of all this, if I can say, information that is coming now about MDR, we have this, um, all the MDCG information, all the uh, associations in France, in Germany, all the manufacturers start to push to say, let's move that. Uh, Switzerland that start to also freak out and say, okay, let's let's uh, go to the FDA now, etc. Okay. So all this, then we arrive to this EPSCO meeting where yes. now they say, okay. It, it, was it like, oh, now it's too much, now let's make the change? Or wh what do you think? Oh, here? no, no, no. Because what, what happened was that, of course, we knew the last EBSCO meeting was in June. And uh, these EBSCO meetings are every six months. So <clears throat> what happened was that in the June EBSCO meeting, the commission was given a mandate to come up with a, with a legislative solution to fix this problem. Okay. A lot of people have completely forgotten about that, but the commission was told, hey guys, you have mandates to come up with an initiative. So everybody like me was like, where's the proposal? Where's the proposal? They are going to make a proposal at the 9 December EBSCO meeting. Come on, proposal. Yeah, and then uh, then uh, there was, uh, yeah, there was the commissioner. Well, what we could also say that was also interesting, there was also this, this parliamentary hearing just before the EBSCO meeting where the uh, commissioner had to appear in the European Parliament where she was basically got a big dress down by the uh, by a whole row of very angry Euro parliamentarians that were saying like, uh, why can't you get this shit under control? Why is it taking so long? What the beep is wrong with you that you can't 
just make this work. Where is Udemy? Um, <laughs> and all, also one of them said, yeah, and if you come with a legislative solution, don't think that you are going to just make us sign on the dotted line without any criticism like you did last time with the NDR extension. No, we are going to really sit down and look at it at whatever you propose. So basically the tone was set a bit for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the EBSCO meeting. And I think that might also explain why the commission didn't have a completely ready proposal to make at the EBSCO meeting. So what they did was they, they sent in this, this note that I've been referring to, which has original measures, has one page of a proposal on a couple of points that I think are still very broad, yeah. and very open, very not so very de definitive and specific. So it's really, uh, it's like, as the commission says, that the elements could include of the proposal. So it's what I said. I, I made a small video on, on LinkedIn and said, there is a lot of maybe, could, likely, etc. Mm. So it's, it's, it's why I said to, to people, uh, be careful of what you are reading. It's just, yeah, of course. just a note. It's not a proposal. It's not a, a law at all. So it can completely change, so don't be careful of this kind of I thing. I saw a whole bunch of consultants immediately after the EBSCO meeting. They were like, it's official. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a commission proposal. No, people. There was no commission proposal. There were just, there was an outline, a very tentative outline of a very broadly formulated, non-specific points that could be included in the proposal. So... Every consultant that that immediately started saying that there was an official proposal, shame on you! Really, uh, it's uh, no, no. It's, it, it, so just to remind what was mentioned, it was mentioned on the proposal that, uh, for example, the date normally the the end date of the transition uh, oh. period is the twenty sixth of May, twenty twenty four. Now mm -hmm. they propose to extend that until the twenty twenty seven for yeah. class 2B and class 3, and 2028 yeah. for class 2A and class 1 up classified. Already they are, they are putting just years. It can be January 1st, it can be December 30th of exactly. 2027. Don't we don't know for the moment. So there are still a lot of uncertainty. There were also the discussion about uh, those the certificate that will be expiring, so to, to mm -hmm. see how we can extend that or, or find a solution. It's also that there is no mechanism that was defined. It was just, we will try to look at that. There was yeah. also the sell off process, uh, the sell off date that was removed, the 26th of yeah, May. That's, that's kind of a specific measure, Monier, because and that makes a lot of sense actually that they do that. Because if you start to, um, if you start to have uh, an extended grace period uh, a bit on the IVDR model, eh? because yeah. I predicted if the commission is going to do something with extensions, it is going to be a, an extended stacked grace period like they did for the IVDR with high risk classes first and low risk classes last. Makes no sense from a logical perspective, yeah. but they did it before. So they do it again. That was my prediction, it was easy prediction. I was completely right on that. Same as that I uh, predicted that they were going to do something with Article uh, 97, yeah. except the only point where I was wrong was that I said um, I would expect an implementing measure under Article 97.3, in which they would harmonize this on the European level, and they didn't. They just put in uh, an MDCG position paper, apparently, so that the Commission is not responsible for this harmonization. And also the member states can still basically pretty much still do what they uh, like. But to come back to the uh, to the sell-off period, um, it yeah, I mean, if this, the sell-off period has a legal deadline ending on uh, 27 May 2025. Yeah. So you have to move that deadline or take it away. And basically what they decided was we are going to remove it altogether. At least that's what the proposal says that they might do. <clears throat> which means that all the companies that were now looking at shit, I have to get place as much product on the market uh, before my certificate expires and also get it to the customers before the end of the sell-off period, at least that pressure is off because there was also a lot of uh, criticism from stakeholders on that this, this year 
selling sell-off period was just too short. Of course, you can also start earlier with selling off, of course, but yeah. uh, hey, you wouldn't be a, a rational, greedy company if you wouldn't wait with that until the very, 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 very last minute. So... Uh, so um, yeah, so we have we have if I can say those notes that were provided. Yeah. We have then the discussion during the EPSCO meeting where we they made the proposal as as they said. All the member state one by one was speaking and saying what they had to say about it or if they accept. Yeah, that, that, well, those were all non-statements like, oh, how nice that the commission does something. Oh, we think this, oh, we think that. But of course, if the commission is going to make a proposal. This will be completely socialized with the member states already. Exactly. Like, for example, I think Malta as a member state said, yeah, but we don't need two deadlines. We need one deadline for, so not 27, 28. We just need one deadline, for example. Well, I can, you can be pretty sure that Malta is not going to prevail on that point because everybody's going to say, nice, uh, nice idea, Malta, but uh, no. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that. Uh, Basically, what's on the table is, let's say, the framework, and then we will get uh, the commission is apparently, yeah, they, they just didn't have time to really think this through yet. So that's why they came with uh, this these outlines of a proposal. Yeah. And the commissioner was saying during the meeting, yes, earliest, earliest possible in January 2023. Like, which, well, I don't know when the commission comes back from holiday, but then they probably will need some more time. So it, it'll be, if it's halfway January, I would be uh, really, uh, really amazed. So, yeah. uh, so and then I, we I, need to see how this, what, what they are going to put on the table in the exactly. end, also when it's going to enter into force, because the parliament said, look, we, we really want to take a good look at this. So it might even be amended by the parliament. Who knows? So um, on one of the elements that we they were talking, as I've said during the the, the speech of the the commissioner, so the idea was to say, okay, we will also. She said that we'll also issue an MDCG position paper on yeah. um, the the ex certificates that are expiring now and seeing how we can uh, handle them. So mm -hmm. um, there was this discussion, and we are, if I can say, a lot of us were watching that live and looking at what they are saying, and mm -hmm. uh, then commenting. All this, what does it mean when this is in place? And 30 minutes or 45 minutes or less than one hour later, we have an MDCG guidance position yeah. paper that is issued, MDCG 2022-18. And we said, oh, they already issued that, the one, the mechanism of extension and everything. And everybody jumped on that. But when you read it, it has nothing to do about an extension here. So can we yep. just talk quickly about what it is exactly? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because... Uh... Again, just like uh, 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 quite some consultants said, we have an official proposal. We're wrong. There were also people uh, that were saying, yeah, we now have a, a mechanism for extending certificates. No, totally wrong. That's not what it says because Article 97, because that is what this, this position paper is about, is not about extension of certificates. It's about allowing a product that does not meet the formal requirements of being CE marked on the market, nonetheless, because it does not pose any threat uh, or does not have any risk that would necessitate removal of the product from the market. That is the criterion. So basically, you get it's like uh, it's like uh, you break the law, but the law is not enforced against you. That is what this is like. It's not an extension of certificates. Really, really not. And that's an important point because it also means, and that's very important for manufacturers to realize and for consultants to tell manufacturers, is that since there is no extension, but you need to request an exemption at a competent authority for each individual device yeah. so if you as a manufacturer think like oh my uh, my certificate expires i ask for an article 97 exemption for my certificate not how it works because that's not how article 97 works article 97 works on a per device basis so if you have a hundred thousand different devices covered under your single certificate you are going to have to request an Article 97 exemption for each 
individual device. And for each individual device, you will need to argue why the device is safe, why it has a spotless vigilance record, all of these things that are set out as criteria in the uh, in the uh, um, MDCG 2021-2022-18 position paper. Exactly. Really important to realize, and that also shows why this is such an enormous truckload of work for manufacturers, and not only for manufacturers, also for competent authorities. I think that the competent authorities really, yeah, I don't know, it's like they're a bit like the, the, the orchestra on the Titanic, that they don't realize yeah. what enormous freaking wave of work is coming their way exactly. with all these Article 97 uh, derogation uh, uh, exemption uh, requests. Because, you know, I mean, in the Netherlands, I sometimes make these applications. It takes the authorities two weeks to process exactly. one, one for one device. So, so, so I so mean, the, I, think, I think what, what you are saying is really important because I just talked about that with a customer this morning and we had this discussion because they have their certificate that will expire the beginning of January, 6th of January. And they say, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? So I looked at their thing and say. Guys, even if you do it now, maybe they will answer to you in two months or three months or this and that because everybody will be rushing to the competent authority. Everybody will do that. And it's not just a formula to fill to say, can I have an, uh, can you, uh, can you uh, give me an ex exception? You can see now on the MDCG 2022 18, there is also an annex where it shows exactly yeah, what you have to provide. Later, which was really helpful because when I saw this document for the first time on 9 December, I was like, Okay, this is nice. So that means that we are still looking at separate national forms exactly. and stuff like this. This is so helpful. Thank you very much, MDCG. You really know how to make a formalist lawyer like me happy and confused. So, but now, uh, yeah, I think it was actually today or something that they uh, apparently updated the, uh, the document with an annex with a checklist. So a checklist, dear people, consultants, a checklist is not a form. Exactly. Keep that in mind. So that means that a checklist uh, is a list of elements that has to be in a proposal. But it's not like, uh, uh, it's like people that say that Annex 1 is a GSPR checklist. No, it's not a checklist. It's a requirement. Exactly. Thing. And it's the same with this Annex. It's... Um, it, it shows the requirements and it also shows what documents need to be provided. So it's it's not a checklist because these documents are really, sometimes they're very broad. Like, for example, um, you have to provide, and I'm looking at the, uh, at the annex now, vigilance, market surveillance, or other information. Mm -hmm. It's not very specific, I can tell you to demonstrate that the device does not pose an unacceptable risk or to uh, or, or uh, for for patient users and so on or for their public health yeah there, so there is also there is one one thing that is also important is also the fact that they were saying that uh, it's something i read but i don't know if it's really applicable it says also it's for small and medium businesses it says also it's for uh, companies that have a notified body that is not yet registered uh, a certified under MDR. So there are yeah. a lot of conditions also on this document to say this is applicable to do to you in that case if you have already an agreement with a notified body that is doing that. So it's not like you are just on this transition period waiting for the end of your oh, expiration no, no. date oh. and then you, you can apply for it. There are some conditions before you apply to it. Exactly. Yeah. So for, for basically all the normal companies, you uh, already need and because the criteria is you need to have undertaken reasonable efforts to exactly. transition the device to the MDR. Basically, we knew that from the very first position paper that I mentioned, right? The 2022-11. So what does it mean, reasonable efforts to transition? It means that your, um, that your application for conformity assessment has to be has to have been accepted by a notified body. Yeah. And that's a big thing. Eh? It's not like you have sort of gone to your bicycle to a notified body and then stuffed your application in the door and say, uh, here, good luck. 
now you have my application, I am eligible for Article 97. No, you need a validated and accepted application. And that is something that not everybody gets. Actually, and you may remember that uh, that was also in, I think, in the NDCG 2022-14 position paper, that in a very large part of the uh, cases, the notified body rejects the first yeah. application because yeah. it just doesn't meet the requirements. So that means that, again, consultants, manufacturers, the trigger is not that you manage to uh, email your application to a notified body. No, the notified body has to have said, yes, this is okay. We have validated it. Now we are underway with the conformity assessment. So that also means that you cannot permit yourself to basically fudge your application uh, at the notified body in order to see if you can get in under Article 97. Because if the notified body rejects the application, you are back at square one, or maybe even before square one. That's a very important one. And with the SMEs, yeah, again, the problem there is that they say the manufacturer is an SME. They don't define what an SME is. I assume that they mean an SME in the meaning of the commission and the SME decision, eh, which is referenced in relation to the uh, uh, PRC, for example, because SMEs are allowed to have an outcome the PRC. That decision, that provides the criteria for when you are an SME. But also, again, um, yeah, when has an SME undertaken reasonable uh, efforts to apply to a considerable number of relevant notified bodies? There's a lot I of qualifiers there. What that. is a considerable number of notified bodies? I mean, in these days that you are you should be happy that a notified body even <laughs> picks up the phone what is a considerable number? Three, five, 10, 15? I don't know. So, so we can see here that it's not so easy. It's not like just an application. It's not like we just contact them and it's done the next day. It's really yeah. a process that can take already some time. You have to gather some documents. You have to pro pro provide that to the competent authority. They have to look at that. And as we said, maybe there are 200, 300, 500 companies that are contacting them at the same time. Each company has maybe 10 products or 20 or 100 products to, to go through. So as you said, it's a big wave that is coming to competent authorities. Mm -hmm. And I suppose they have they don't have the if I can say bandwidth to to take care of that. Oh, no, so, of course not. <laughs> yeah, we are looking now to this major unless, potential... unless, they, unless everybody has cloned themselves like four times at the competent authority in the meantime, but uh, that's uh... It's it's possible, but unlikely. Let's put yeah. it that. <laughs> so now we are, I hope, hoping to receive a, a real other proposal or other MDCG guidance from the commission with a mechanism that can work. Um, now, the while we are waiting, if I can say, um, what happens I make, now... I make one remark, Daria Monier, because uh, that, <clears throat> that proposal... And that's one of the elements that we did not discuss uh, yet, is that uh, also the Commission says in their note that they might uh, change Article 120, Section 2, yeah. Yeah. right? Which is, the, uh, which is basically the backstop date for uh, when a certificate, when the uh, grace period ends for a device. So there they say, well, we might uh, combine uh, uh, the extension of the transitional period. So they're basically saying we could do two things. We could uh, we could extend the transitional period, right? So that's the 27-28 situation apparently. But they also say, well, we can also combine this with an extension of the validity of certificates issued under the directives. And that is a really interesting thing because that is basically a safety valve for this enormous tsunami of Article 97 requests that will come the way of the member states. Also, in some member states, way more than others, eh? because I mean, there are some member states have way more manufacturers and authorized representatives than, uh, than others, for example. I mean, in my own member state, uh, the Netherlands, I know there are a lot of big manufacturers and authorized representatives located. And I know for a fact that the Dutch competent authority is absolutely 
totally understaffed for this. This will be a complete nightmare in the Netherlands. Uh, that is something I am uh, very uh, confident about. People will be waiting for months for uh, these things to trickle through. But back to the uh, uh, back to the proposal. So what they might do as well is to say, well, what we are going to do because Article 120, Section 2 now says your grace period ends if your certificate expires mm -hmm. uh, somewhere between 2021 and 2024 yeah. or by 26 May 2024 at the latest. Yeah. Now, if they are going to do something with the uh, extension of the validity of certificates, they could do two things. They could say, we just moved the backstop date the 26 May 2024 date, which would mean that they would solve a lot of problems because there are many, 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 many certificates with the 26 May 2024, 2024 date. I've even seen some by the Polish notified body with 27 May 2024. Oh, really? <laughs> I think it's kind of illegal, but... Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I did say it's a of it for my collection of things that we might get legal questions about later in the future. But anyway, that was from the notified body that took all the uh, UL uh, customers. Yeah, yeah um, I remember this one. Yeah, Polsky something. Anyway, but so what can we could we get? So they could maybe move the uh, the twenty twenty the, the May twenty twenty four date. But there are also other things that they could do. They could also say, well. What we are going to do is we are going to uh, put in a legal measure that says that any uh, <clears throat> that also the date the date on the certificate itself before 26 May 2024 that makes the certificate expire that we also prolong that so that basically there comes a single backstop date uh, let's say for example uh, the, the date in 27 for class three and two B and the date in 28 for um, uh, one and class for, uh, for one and two a this way basically all the uh, certificates are automatically prolonged for the grace period would be really nice would save the member states an insane amount of work mm -hmm. only problem is yes you will have extended certificates that then are subject to survey to normal surveillance by the notified bodies by the way, also the, the appropriate surveillance MBCG uh, was updated uh, today, uh, I saw. Yeah. But anyway, then the question is, but what are you going to do with the people that already had certificates expiring between 2021 and 2024? And we and have that, this question, actually. We have a, a lot of people say, oh, my certificate is expired. Can this help me to then continue to sell without waiting because they are trying to bridge that? Can my certificate revive? Well, if the commission wants, maybe it can. But then who is going to put a check on whether this is actually possible? Yeah. Are they then going to say, oh, yeah, but the notified body of the expired certificate should resume appropriate surveillance for these products until 2028, for example. I mean, I don't know if they're going to do that. No, I don't know. There yeah. may be notified bodies that would be happy with the business, but there might also be notified bodies that say, hey, look, we were going to close. We were going to stop all this crazy stuff of the end uh, of medical devices because it's just too unpredictable. Because also, I mean, I don't know if you are thinking about that, but look at all these notified bodies that have like ballooned their staff when this whole transitional period stuff is over where are all these people going to go because I mean, it's not going to stay at the right level no. we then suddenly have like the the mother of all cutthroat competition in the consultants market because all these notified body people are suddenly going to go to the consultants market because where will they go? Yeah, they might go to companies, they might go become consultants. They will definitely not all be uh, at a competent authority because competent authorities can't afford it. So yeah, I mean, I mean, this is this is something that uh, yeah, there is a some kind of wish proposal and everything, but the situation that can happen is also the same situation that happened when we initiated the UMDR with a lot of good good things or proposals but the infrastructure or the resources or the things that are behind it is not in place so 
This can also be yeah. the issue at a certain moment. Why I've come up with a new name for the uh, medical devices regulation. It's basically, it's a bit of, uh, I, I stole it a bit from uh, Pascal Wettstein, the, the Swiss uh, consultant. So you, we should really call it now the MVDR. Yeah. Which is the minima, minimally viable device regulation because <laughs> it's still totally unfinished, completely unfunctional, no UDAMET, no working transitional regime. It's uh, it's, it's it's something that um, uh, it's why also uh, we have this situation with the competition with the FDA. We have all this that's happening. It's also because people are seeing that and are not really seeing where we are going here. We 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 wished. I mean, they wished to have this extension of the date. Now, if I can say, they will have it. Uh, we are just waiting for the proposal to have a better understanding how it's how it is uh, uh, how it is done. But um, at a certain point, um, there is still a lot of uncertainty. There are still a lot of companies that are not knowing. As I've said, there are some companies that are having their certificate expiring in the next month. So what are they doing here? So uh, I, think, I think it's all so sad because before the NDR came to the scene and before these, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, scandals happened, I mean, everybody in the world was jealous of this fantastic, super efficiency e-marking system. And now... It's been completely ruined, basically, we're the laughing stock of the world, the way we are basically playing continuous catch up. And uh, well, since we're in the world champion uh, soccer, uh, panic soccer, I don't know, is that an expression in French? In Dutch, we have this nice expression, panic football, which means yeah. like panic soccer. Okay. It's like when, when the team has basically lost lost its coordination, doesn't know what to do anymore. So they're still playing, but you can see that the whole plan is gone and that the other party can just basically roll them up. And that is that is where we are. We are in NDR panic soccer. We are just slapping on one remedy on another remedy. And it's, it's yeah, it's... it's... So if, if you had now an advice to provide to those manufacturers that are listening to all this and thinking that there is already a proposal that is done, that there is already a solution for extension, that there is... So yeah. what what will, do, would you say to them, wait, because they have their such a inspiring... If they, they think this, then they should either check their own assumptions or fire their regulatory persons that have been telling them that, because apparently... Nobody in the company knows what they're talking about, or somebody is having a very uh, extreme case of wishful thinking. No, I mean the only thing you get, yeah, you can basically do is you can uh, uh, you can uh, start to think about how you will uh, work with the Article Ninety Seven situation. Yeah. Right. Uh, which has the contingency that. It might be that you need in the end and need, that you in the end end up asking for a lot less Article 97 provisions if the Commission does something with extension of certificate duration. But we will only know that in January. But it's better to prepare now and have a good picture of uh, what, what things might look like. Um, yeah. And for the rest, yeah, really check. <clears throat> Uh, to what extent you are basically a manufacturer in good stead eh? that has uh, a manufacturer that has uh, uh, has is in transition to the that can prove that he's in transition to the MDR because for any emergency measure that is currently under the, on the table this is what they ask for unless you're an SME and unless in special cases you uh, for SMEs. They might ease off on that, but you really need to show that you've been really doing what you can, because otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's easy for the authorities to say, okay, sorry, no, that's not good enough. And, and you we also have... need to be prepared, actually, for all the weird differences in member states, eh? because, uh, for example, uh, in a country like Germany, you cannot apply for an Article 97 request at B Farm, the central uh, competent yeah. authority. You have to go through the competent authority of each different land Lands, exactly. in Germany, uh, because Germany is a federation, and this kind of power is with the. Uh, uh, now, the good part is, fortunately, that uh, and that is something that I think is good about the uh, position paper, the 2022-18. So, if you've got one Article 90 exemption 
uh, Article 97 exemption in one place, it applies to the whole union. Exactly. But that's good. That also raises other really interesting questions, like, for example, can the MHRA, who is still the competent authority for Northern Ireland, who is still in the union, issue an Article 97 exemption to a manufacturer or a manufacturer with an authorized representative in Northern Ireland that would apply into the rest of Europe. That would be really crazy. But I've been thinking about this and and I don't see why it wouldn't work because the Northern Ireland protocol is still in uh, function, even though people are trying very hard to get rid of it. But this is the, I mean, you get these really weird permutations. And this is also something I actually predicted correctly when the uh, 2022-11 position paper came out, I said, if they are going to go for an Article 97 solution, it will look like what we currently know with orphaning. And this is exactly what happened. So I was very happy to be to have sensed that uh, correctly uh, as well. And, um, and we had yeah. we had made a podcast episode about orphaning. So if people are, want to dig that from the archives and try yes. to find it again, but we talked about orphaning even before MDR came came in because we, we thought maybe if people cannot move to MDR, what they can do. So they, this was also one right. one of the solutions here. Um, so I, I think yeah, as we said, so there are a lot of uncertainty still. So if you can wait, better to wait until January uh, to see what what the, what the commission is doing. Yeah, but in proposing. the meantime, do an inventory of your yeah. options. Very important. So look at where are my devices at the moment, and especially which devices, I would categorize my devices like which devices are already subject to conformity assessment, but won't be ready before the certificate expires. Which devices will be are in conformity assessment, assessment, but will be ready before the certificate expires. Which devices are on the planning to start conformity assessment at some point? Because mind you, a lot of companies are in a situation where they've agreed a sort of roadmap with the notified bodies, especially the big multinationals, where the notified body says, okay, then you send in your uh, technical documentation by that date. By then, because in a situation like that, only by the date that you send in your application for conformity assessment and it has been validated by the notified body, that is a date that counts for these emergency measures. Yeah. So the fact that you have a roadmap agreed with the notified body means absolutely diddly squat for these um for these emergency measures. So this is what I would start to do if I were a manufacturer immediately as a matter of urgency, look at which categories of my devices are exposed in uh, what way using uh, these at least these three categories. And we have also the secret weapon of uh, placing on the market, which is, uh, I suppose, also working here. Yeah, it is, it is and it is not, because what you see is that um, most companies, I mean, placing on the market sounds nice, but you can only place devices on the market that have already been produced. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not like, it's not like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this Charlie Chaplin uh, movie, Modern Times, where yeah. he works at the conveyor belt and then yeah. they make the conveyor belt go faster. Not how it works in practice. So it's not that a manufacturer can say, oh, 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 there's a regulatory deadline coming. I will just make my conveyor belt go three times as fast because Charlie will uh, will fix it. No, that's not how it works. In practice, because supply chains and and also raw materials and supply of parts, it's so complicated that you you cannot just push on the gas and make your production go faster for most manufacturers. So. Uh, so this 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 works only yeah if you have already a big stock of products and you are maybe uh, worrying yeah. to have uh, an issue to place them on the market after the expiration of your certificate so place them on the market before and then you are on the safe side uh, on, on this case and understand what placing on the market means exactly because, I mean <laughs> look at the blue guy you can have about that. Yeah, we have also some podcast episodes about that. Eric, um, so thank you for all those information. And I hope really it clarified. It was a longer podcast because we have really a lot of things to, to discuss and try to clarify a lot of things here. Uh, really just wanted pleasure. to remind people that you are also you have also issued your book. I mean, a new uh, edition. Of your the book. Second, second edition, yes. Exactly. 
So um, for people that want to look at that, we have also the uh, the, the link on the show notes. And uh, Eric was nice to provide a, a coupon code for a promo code for Easy Medical Device. So use the promo, co- promo code Easy Medical Device 10 uh, and you will get uh, what, what you will get from it. 10% discount. 10% discount. So great. So don't Still hesitate to go to money. the show notes and, and see all of, of this. So, so Eric, it was really a pleasure. Um, I, I am sure I will talk again with you on, on January as soon as there will yes. be uh, information and we try to clarify. But yeah, d- don't, don't take all what we have said, all what pe- all people say is like, it's done. There is nothing done for the moment. We are just waiting, just an alert that something is, in, is, is ongoing. Let's wait for the official document and then we can provide you the most accurate information about how so you can use that. There's, there's an official proposal, slap them in the face and tell them they're an idiot. Because <laughs> it's just not true. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Thanks uh, to everyone and I wish you a nice day. Take care. Bye-bye.